hello and welcome again uh, for the December M68K chat. And tonight we have uh, Nick uh, here um, and uh, we will talk about uh, LLVM compiling the Linux kernel with LLVM and especially compiling the Linux kernel with LLVM for M68K. Um, so Nick, can you unmute? Yeah, hi there, Carson. Hey. Um, so um, can you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about what you do with LLVM uh, and especially why it is interesting to compile the Linux kernel with LLVM? Sure, yeah. I think, um, yeah, the, the, the Linux kernel is, I think, in my opinion, one of the most important bodies of um, free or open source software available. And what's very interesting about it is um, it, it has the ability to target probably the most diverse range of architectures. Um, literally the, the, the number of supported architectures or targetable architectures is close to about uh, 20 different, you know, wildly different kinds of machines. And, um, you know, there, there's a fair amount of architecture specific code, typically around initialization and, you know, some fine level details, but actually a, a fair amount, vast majority of the code in the kernel is just um, more portable kind of C code that, that can run on such a wide variety of targets. And, you know, there's a really rich history between um, the GNU compiler collection and the Linux kernel um, in, in Linux's first uh, email kind of introducing or announcing uh, the Linux kernel. Um, he kind of said like, oh, you know, I've, I've ported GCC to run on top of my operating system that I've, that I've built um, kind of thing. So, uh, what what's kind of an interesting historical artifact is that these two code bases have kind of co-evolved over time and kind of become very tightly coupled um, in a way where uh, at least for a while it made it very difficult to use LLVM and, and use Clang um, as an alternative or substitute um, tool chain for building the kernel and a lot of work has gone into LLVM into supporting the various GNU C extensions, you'll, you'll see um, not only does, is the kernel built with a kind of GNU variant or flavor of, of C, but they actually are probably one of the larger consumers of most of the extensions um, on top of the language. And, and there's some very nice ones in there. There's some ones that, you know, could, could use some better specification and, and whatnot, but um, really by working through trying to build the kernel with Clang in LLVM, we've been able to kind of decouple it from GCC. We've been able to kind of spot undefined behaviors in the kernel. Um, we've been able to add functionality to the kernel that leverages newer technologies that are specific, that only LLVM has so far kind of thing. And in the process, we've kind of improved both code bases. They've, they've you know, we've been able to find and fix, you know, pretty awful bugs in, in LLVM thanks to trying to build the kernel with it, trying to boot it. Um, but we've also found some pretty awful undefined behaviors that I would say are maybe not the good kinds in the kernel and have been able to re resolve those, right? And so my hope is that, you know, that even could potentially help future upgrades of GCC for building the kernel is, you know, if they make more aggressive transforms um, in the same fashion that LLVM was doing, you know, th there's no longer a tax to be paid on this. It's already been paid. Kind of thing. Is the uh, the Linux development community um, in in f or helpful in the project of of doing this with LLVM, or do they just say, um, yeah, do it, but don't don't bother us with that? that? Uh, I I would say folks are very helpful, um, kind mm -hmm. of thing. I think uh, it it took us a while to kind of get to that point because um, you know in the beginning we had lots and lots of issues. We didn't really have any kind of CI coverage. Um, <laughs> But I think as and I think people's number one reservation was there was almost like a fear that, you know, the 25 million lines or however many now in the kernel would be like suddenly become full of if defs for like, you know, mm -hmm. if def clang versus GCC kind of thing. And what's kind of amazing is we've been able to isolate um, tool chain specific 
patches to, I would estimate on the order of like 200 to 500 lines, mostly in one header. And there's some unfortunate unspecified AVIs where we've had to do like custom code um, for unwinders and stuff, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we're working with, with ABI vendors in, in that regard to try to clarify some things. But um, I, I think uh, nowadays it's, it's interesting to see, um, like I get CC'd on pretty much every CI report from all these different sources. Many different people have these CI systems. And what it's always funny to me when like I'll notice that, oh, this, this was a build with Clang, a new warning popped up and someone will respond saying, oh, sorry, I'll fix that. And to me, I kind of smirk because they didn't even notice that this was a build that the CI bot did this build with Clang or that this was a Clang specific warning. It's just, you know, everyone kind of sees the value here in having additional, additional warning coverage um, and, you know, additional um, kind of, yeah, just coverage all around kind of thing. Um, so what's been interesting is to, to see um, patches come in from lots of different developers, you know, on their own or working for larger companies to kind of see, you know, who else is, is playing with this, who else is taking a look at this kind of thing. And um, I think one of the things that's most interesting is that uh, I, I've, at, I've seen at least three pull requests. Um, usually the, the kernel development cycle is like, there's a merge window that opens for about two weeks and then um, that closes. And then there's about a two month kind of resting period where people will just send fixes and not new features. So, you know, if you, if you just missed the bus with a large new feature for the kernel, typically you need to wait about two months before it'll land in the mainline kernel. And, you know, during this time, maintainers are sending Linus pull requests. And I've seen Linus reject at least th three pull requests saying, hey, I see this observes a new warning with Clang, right? right. So you, you better go fix this. I'm not gonna accept this pull request kind of thing. So I think um, that for us was kind of, you know, I was very nervous about, you know, to me, I think a lot of, there's a lot of strong opinions in the kernel community, but I think a lot of people will um, kind of echo the sentiment of, you know, what is what does the leadership think, right? You know, it, it's, uh, I think in the community, the leadership will come up with ideas or say like, this is what's gonna happen, right? And, and a lot of people will kind of, you know, follow follow suit in that regard. And so, you know, really I viewed it as, we, we really need to make sure that that this works out of the box for Linus, for other developers, such that you know it, it's it's uh, it's not painful to to switch, right? If you think about just in terms of like economics of substitute goods, right? You know you need to lower the kind of cost or overhead to, to switch. And I think you know we've we've done a really good job of that. Um, and in particular, I've tried to form an open source community around um, developers. Um, you know, particularly in my case. I'm very zealous about contributing to open source software. And, um, you know, I, I'm interested in trying to train people and help them figure out how to be, become active contributors to the code bases that, that they love that are important to them. And so um, uh, we have a GitHub org with over a hundred different people where many of their kind of first time contributions ever to the Linux kernel or to LLVM have been you know, fixing warnings that are client specific in the Linux kernel where, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take the time to write up, you know, what, what, what is an issue that I observe? And it might be something that I can fix easily myself in five minutes. But if I take 20 minutes to write up a bug report, you know, here's what I observed, here's how to reproduce it. You know, here's which architecture I observe this for, right. And then kind of mark it as like, this is a good beginner bug. Um, you know, sometimes we get lifetime contributors out of that. Sometimes it's a drive-by contributor, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always happy to, to kind of do the outreach or, or help people um, get up to speed on becoming active contributors on these code bases. What is the, the current status when um, the Linux kernel is compiled with LLVM? Is it completely working or 90% or, um, yeah, how, it, how it, it, production it's ready is it? It's a great question. Um, so when you when you build a Linux kernel, the Linux kernel is highly configurable. Um, so you basically, if you're building a, a distribution where you're not really sure what what users are going to try to install this on, it's very common to kind of enable um, 
almost like every driver possible, right? And, and there's ways of like dynamically loading the drivers versus statically compiling them into an image. And there's kind of a trade-off in, you know, then how, how painful does that make distribution, right? So um, the latest statistics this past year, a professor at INRIA estimated that like ran through the, the combinatorics and said, yeah, there's 10 to the 6,000 combinations of kernel configs, <laughs> which, uh, so I don't promise that all of those work with Clang. Um, and in fact, the professor found that, you know, five to 6% of those don't even work with GCC, which, which is interesting, right? It's like, you can, you can have configs, but, um, for the most part, I, uh, it's, it's production ready. So in, Pixel 2 was the first phone that we shipped. So Pixel 2 is AR64 or like kind of the 64-bit ARM V8. Um, so that was kind of the first architecture that we, we really supported. Um, and Pixel 2 shipped, um, I think in 2017, so about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, you know, we started looking into 64-bit x86 and that was the next architecture we got online. Um, so from there, uh, Android moved over to um, building to like suggesting that all other OEMs in the ecosystem build their kernels with Clang um, to the point where now um, it's it's actually required. So anyone releasing an Android phone either this year or you know subsequent years is required to build their their kernels with Clang. Um, and so we have um, on the Android side, it, it's primarily 64-bit ARM, 32-bit ARM and x86 64 um 64 bit variants um from there i think two years ago chrome os cut over to building their kernels with clang as well so they're much more heavily x86 64 but also a little bit 32 bit arm and 64 bit arm um, and then just over the course of the summer now um google's production fleet of um data centers have all uh, rolled out Clang built kernels. So those are primarily x86-64. Um, there is a handful of 64-bit ARM and 64-bit PowerPC in there, all, uh, little Endian. Um, and so uh, if you visit google.com right now, it's highly likely that your request was served by multiple machines with Clang built kernels. Kind of thing. Um, from there, there's another Linux distribution, Open Mandriva. Um, the, their latest release is 4.2, in which they have packages available for Clang built kernels. And their team leads tell me that their next release, not sure if that'll be 4.3 or 5, if, like 5.0, um, will cut over to Clang built kernels by default, kind of thing. So I would say, in that sense, um, I really think of x86 and um and arm uh 32 bit and 64 bit as kind of being our most well tested systems um and from there uh we have ci coverage of numerous other architectures as well so um i would say the other ones that that we test in limited configurations are um power pc and mips and again, there's 64 bit variants of those. Those are by Indian architectures. So, um, you know, we have pretty good coverage of both the little Indian and the big Indian variants, except a big issue is that LLD, LLVM's linker, doesn't support any big Indian targets. So that makes it a little difficult to um, not only build the compile the C code in the kernel with Clang, but, all, but then link the kernel image using LLVM's linker or use Clang's integrated assembler versus the GNU assembler mm. and, you know, kind of substitute all of the utilities that you would find in GNU bin utils. Um, but uh, so then theoretically there's backends for um, an LLVM backend, but also Linux kernel support for um, ARC, Hexagon, RISC-V, S390, Spark, um, CSky, and potentially Motorola 68K kind of thing that we would like to add to the list. Um, and then from there, um, LLVM has support for numerous architectures that the Linux kernel doesn't support. Those would be Alpha, um, C6X, um, H8300, uh, Itanium. Sorry, I have this, this list wrong. These are the list of architectures that the Linux kernel does support, but LLVM does not, mm -hmm. right? So, so this is kind of 
you know, people love, love to hold over our heads that GCC <laughs> is a, uh, has many more targets currently than, than LLB does. So, so that list um, of interest for kernel developers is Alpha, C6K, um, H8300, Itanium, um, Motorola 68K, well, work in progress, right? Microblaze, NDS32, NIOS2, OpenRISC, PARISC, SuperH, and Extensa. And then finally, um, LLVM has some targets that the Linux kernel doesn't support, um, maybe doesn't make sense um, running, which those would be AMD GPU, AVR BPF, which is interesting because it's actually you know a kernel virtual machine thing, um, Lanai MSP430, NVPTX, um, VE is a newer one, I forget what that stands for, um, uh, WebAssembly and, and XCore kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I almost imagine like a Venn diagram of, you know, what does LLVM support? What does the Linux kernel support? You know, there's a wide overlap there. If you imagine, you know, yet another circle for GCC, you know, there's, there's much more overlap between uh, the, the Linux kernel and GCC there, but, you know, there's a good portion in the middle where all three of these kind of support things, but, and yet, you know, there's, there's outliers there where, where Linux doesn't support every architecture under the sun kind of thing. Sure. Um, what is the, the current status of um, the Motorola M68K support? Uh, w within the Linux kernel or within LLVM? Um, with uh, LLVM and the Linux kernel. I mean, the um, ha having both together. Uh, so I, uh, we, we had uh, Min uh, on, on this chat uh, a few weeks ago about um, his work on LLVM and the M68K uh, mm -hmm. stuff. And of course, there is a, a, a Linux kernel for M68K um, mm -hmm. done with the GNU compiler. Um, and I understand from what you've told, it's, it's uh, not there, but is there already some work done there or is it a clean sheet that should theoretically work, but uh, needs a, a lot uh, more um, attention to uh, to get it running. Sounds like Min's here in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah I, I would say uh, from an investigatory period, I think that that's, that's what I'm here for is, you know, I, I would like to find out, you know, kind of what's the state of the LLVM backend? And is this something where, you know, are there patches I should go fetch and download and try this out kind of thing? Um, you know, I, I think to a lot of kernel developers, um, they they kind of take the the stance that you know they don't want to have to build their compiler from scratch. You know, they want to be able to you know just download the latest release kind of thing. And I think one of the things that's tricky is um, you know I, I absolutely don't feel that way. I'm very happy to to you know build my compiler from source. I do it multiple times a day, you know, before building kernel images, but um, I think that's one of the things with some of these experimental backends, right? Such as, you know, Risk Five was the most, well, was the most recent backend promoted out of experimental status, right? And so, kind of C Sky is now, uh, I would say, the latest that is uh, an LLVM backend that's in the experimental status, right? So you you still have to build LLVM yourself in order to be able to test this out. So, you know, I think really that that's something I'd like to to find out here today is is really, you know, how far along are we? as far as like patches exist, is anything checked in yet? Um, and from there, um, you know, I have kind of my thoughts on, you know, how one might go about targeting the Linux kernel with a new backend like this. And, and really it's kind of following the playbook that, that we've been doing for all these architectures that I listed earlier, which is really, you know, trying to get it to build with Clang without relying on Clang's integrated assembler is probably a good first step. Um, in particular, one of the things that we're finding as we've been substituting Clang for GCC and LLD for BFD and all the other good um, LLVM utilities for the GNU uh, bin utils um, variants is that uh, the GNU assembler supports a lot of what are called uh, uh, pseudo instructions, which, you know, if you if you pull open like the ISA reference manual, you won't find this instruction mnemonic listed anywhere in the document. Instead, you know, this is, you know, really clever shorthand for a really common operation or something helpful like that. And, you know, that, that's something that we found where LLVM kind of repeatedly chokes or trips over where, you know, if someone created something nice, nicer to use in assembler, 
developers are going to use it. And so LLVM kind of has to add, add support for these, but, but um, you know, that, that is only a problem really for inline assembly out of line assembler files. Um, but generally, uh, you know, being able to build some default configuration of the Linux kernel is, is it, itself a massive challenge and will shake out tons of code gen bugs. So, hello, Min. Nice to Hi. have you here. Hi. Hi, Carson. Hi, Nick. Uh, so, thanks, Nick, for the, for the great summaries on the, on the, Linux, uh, on the Linux kernel. Um, you know, my, my impression of uh, using Clan on a big project only stopped at the, uh, like, when Android declared they only support Clan. So, I'm really impressed how, how much effort was put on the Linux kernel space. Um, so, Regarding the, 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 the status, so actually this morning I just checked the fabricator. So uh, among eight, all, you know, eight patches. Now we only have two patches. Oh, oh, oh hold on a second, three patches left. So um, yeah, so I think that was um, really good progress uh, because like three days ago, there's only two patches was uh, 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 approved. And so, uh, so yeah, so after, after all the patches was, um, is approved, it will be an experimental target. And so speaking of, you know, where to just download the tool chain. So I believe Adrian has, um, has already a build bots, set up a build bots uh, in the Elvin org. So ideally, uh, you know, it will generate an artifact and maybe you can just download from, from the test bots. Although I'm not really familiar with how, you know, how test bots uh, is working. Um, in, in, in LVO now. So I don't know how easily you can download the, the, the build binary artifacts uh, for the kernel developers. Um, but yeah, we definitely have a bot to build um, you know, clean, yeah. Probably to start with, you know, I'm, I'm happy just to know whatever the, um, the CMake flag is to enable the experimental backend. And I think from there, uh, really mm -hmm. the first steps are, you know, try to like just start just start trying to build a um, Motorola 68K target um, kernel image. And I think from there, you know, probably, you know, I, I expect that some, building a large body of software like the Linux kernel is, is, will probably take a while and shake out lots of issues. You know, in, mm -hmm. in particular, the first thing that comes to mind are um, kind of architecture specific compiler command line flags kind of thing. And, uh, um, and, you know, I think one of the things, um, I guess one of the things I'm a little bit curious about that I'm, I'm not super familiar with, um, but, you know, maybe I'm asking the right folks here, um, is one of the things that we try to do is not only like build a, a kernel um, in, for our continuous integration um, and ensure that it builds, you know, eventually warning free kind of thing, but, you know, does it actually boot? And so, you know, we've been relying on QEMU to do emulated boot tests on, on kind of larger hosts. And um, I've, I'm curious, uh, I, I assume there's a Motorola 68K support for, for QEMU, but I think that, that's another thing that I'm, I'm really curious about because, you know, for that, that Venn diagram that I kind of, you know, described earlier, you know, I also think of like QEMU support and, you know, in particular for us, um, getting S390 building and booting with Clang, you know, that, that's a roadblock that we've hit where, you know, the, the support story for system Z or, you know, whatever the brand of that, that system is, um, is, a, is a complex, complicated story. <laughs> but, I, you know, I think the first thing really is, is if it's just two patches for me to, to arc patch in, you know, I'm happy to give it a shot and, and start trying to um, report issues. So, um, is it possible for me to share my screen at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Karsten, I think you might have to transfer presenter to me. We yes. use the same body of software for the, the Linux Plumbers Conference. I think so I am familiar with it roughly. Um, we had a LLVM dev room in there where, you know, we talked all things LLVM. So we even talked about, you know, writing drivers in Rust and, you know, <laughs> had, de had demos of yeah. that working kind of thing. So uh, to shortly answer your question, um, currently there's not just two patches, there's actually eight. And uh, if you don't want to download the patches from the fabricators, actually uh, we have um, you know, another GitHub repos uh, hosting of the, our um, 
you know, our working stuff. But the tricky stuff is that because in order to, you know, for the fabricator review, we need to, uh, how do I say that? We, uh, we need to edit each patch. Um, so in that, um, you know, alternative GitHub repo, we have a branch. We call it the, the, the dev branch. And that the dev branch is hosting, uh, is hosting uh, those eight patches. But every time if we want, want to modify one thing, we need to rebase. Because the, like we need to you know navigate to a specific patch and you know rebase and so that will makes every time you need to pull everything because you know once you rebase push you, um, another user need to download and you know invalidate all the history <laughs> so if if you don't mind actually a few days ago I just set up that branch you know that you know we're the, the branch we're uh, specifically working on so and, it's probably easier um, just to pull to add a remote in, yeah yeah in, in, I, I, I set up as the default branch so you can nice. just pull but just be aware um every time i made a change you need to pull everything because the history <laughs> is screwed up <laughs> okay yeah, yeah i think you know yeah. it, the process is definitely iterative kind of thing and, mm -hmm. and you know i think no matter like over time you we we kind of end up making this more and more accessible to more and more developers kind of thing but mm -hmm. you know in the beginning i'm very happy to to roll up my yeah. sleeves and and you know i am totally understanding of all all the yeah. things so um, and yeah and i really hope that you know everything will go upstream by this year <laughs> i really hope because you know once it goes upstream we're we don't have these problems anymore you just you know pull the, the lvm repo you know so right. i really hope it will go through <laughs> So I just wanted to show this page real quick. Is this um, kind of our landing page here? Is this clangbuiltlinux.github.io, um, and so this is kind of really the entry point into you know where our community kind of reports bugs and tests things. You know you can see our uh, our build is red. Um, Travis CI did us a favor and and you know nuked our minutes. I think a couple of open source projects overran their budgets here. So. You know, over the holiday breaks, I'll be rewriting our CI system to use GitHub Actions. Very exciting. You know, thanks, Travis, for that. Um, but, uh, you know, right off the top of the list, you know, a link right into the, the kernel docs as far as, you know, when building the kernel, um, you know, you kind of choose a configuration. Um, and when you're cross compiling, you end up setting um, kind of two variables is really, you know, the kernel has its own naming convention for some um architectures it disagrees with um, but then uh, this cross compile variables is ends up getting translated for clang into the the target triple right when cross compiling um, but i i would say the most important place really for us is our issue tracker um, so you can see here you know we've crunched through quite a number of bugs here you know this this number of open bugs never seems to actually go down uh, it looks like you know i have some new bug reports to read that i've missed since overnight um, but you can see here you know kind of idea shamelessly stolen from rust in the rust compiler and you know their fantastic open source community is you know liberal application of labels um, so you know i try to tag you know if a bug is very specific to one target isa um, so theoretically you know i'd like to add motorola 68k label and you know we tag is this a bug in lvm is this a bug in linux right you know where do we think we'll have to fix things um and you know there's there's labels i track everything about you know where did the patch land because it's very common linux distributions typically don't aren't based off of the mainline linux kernel that's linux torvalds tree um they typically are based off of a separate tree called the stable tree the long-term stable tree um different branches of that right so it's very common i think 5.10 was just blessed minutes ago uh, more like a couple of days ago, but um, you know your distribution probably is using 5.4 um, was the previous um, LTS branch kind of thing. Um, so you know we support um, at least for 64-bit ARM and x86 back to the 4.4 kernel image, which is pretty old at this point kind of thing. Um, but but really um, the GitHub org is is kind of what I'm most proud about is you can see here we have quite a number of people in in the uh the organization that that participate in file bugs here and um you know while the whole org kind of started off focused on the kernel specifically um i think the most recent project um yeah we had like scripts for building lvm itself and like lto like doing lto on on um 
LLVM itself, but also, you know, there's a couple of forks here where like just general open source projects that we've had to fix, but uh, this user space one is an interesting new repo, which is really um, about for any Linux distro that is targeting um, building their user space with Clang. So some of the Red Hat folks are contributing patches here as a staging ground before then upstreaming them. But um, I would say the other thing that, that maybe is interesting is uh, that's more easily linked off the homepage is, you know, our, our wiki has timelines of, um, you know, kind of project history dating back to over 10 years ago where someone first filed a bug in 2009 saying like, hey, we should try to build the Linux kernel with Clang, right? So it's literally been over a 10 year project of many, many people. Um, so, you know, I think it'd be interesting to be able to say, hey, maybe 2021 is the year where, you know, we got some some more architectures out of the experimental status and, and really um, into the first first party, first tier supported kind of list kind of thing. So um, I don't know if there's anything else interesting. Otherwise, um, you know, our mailing list is really high volume. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're doing really core um, Linux kernel development, really. But um, IRC, I haven't been super active on, but actually our Telegram is super popular. Um, and, you know, open invitation, anyone on the call, if you're interested, um, we run, we've been running a bi-weekly meeting publicly for the past four, three to four years. Um, so we're kind of taking a break over the holidays, but, um, you know, there's a link to the calendar and, you know, the, the software we use um, to chat. And so I don't know if it's, uh, let me check my calendar real quick. I think it's, it'll be January 13th, the Wednesday, um, every, every other Wednesday. Um, is our, our next public meeting. So, you know, if anyone's interested in joining us, um, you know, really happy to help, um, you know, just be like, I, I feel like I'm pretty good about juggling, keeping a finger on many, many balls in the air. I'm juggling lots of things, right? So, um, you know, trying to keep up on the status, you know, um, I think one of the things I probably most interesting for me right away is just to subscribe to the patches that are on Fabricator just so I get like, uh, like you know, I'll, I'll pick up on, on emails about, you know, what's the latest status of the patch series. And then as those get burned down, as they get merged in kind of thing. Um, but I think, you know, right off the bat, just trying to target, um, you know, the, the kernel, while it's almost infinitely configurable, typically they'll kind of check in recommended configs or configs that are specific for a particular machine. Um, so if they do have a virtual guest target, that's probably the best first step because, you know, not everyone may have hardware of the ISO you're targeting. Um, you know, I, I've yet to meet anyone that has access to S390 is like a, in a personal capacity. Um, you know, I kind of joke with my chain of command that I'm going to expense S390 mainframe to be able to help here um, kind of thing. But um, I, I think, you know, if there's any recommendations about dev boards, that's something I, I would love to know about because I'm very happy to, you know, go out and fetch one of those. But, you know, I think one of the things my recommendation to this community is, you know, try to pick, um, you know, a good first target and try to get everyone centralized around, you know, make sure people have this as like a dev target. And, you know, that that's a good first step really is, is you know, try to get um, more wood behind fewer arrows and target one particular machine. And then from there, or, or maybe a virtual guest, um, and then from there branch out into you know long tails of different configurations of different machines and things that you see in in, in hardware. So I'll transfer this back to Karsten. Uh, Karsten, do you remember how to what you had to do for that? Because if I click on your name, I only see start a private chat, and I don't. Remember. Yeah, I guess I, I I have to take it back. Um, oh, good. Okay, yeah. Will, as the moderator, you have the power to do. Yeah. That. Okay. Cool. Um, but you can just stop sharing if, uh, yeah, that works. So, uh, Nick, you mentioned um, uh, Rust. And uh, I followed uh, a few discussions in the Linux uh, development community that they uh, plan to implement some parts of the Linux kernel in Rust. What do you think about that? It will probably complicate matters. Oh, uh, I think for sure. I think that that's an open question is, is you know, a lot of things in, in software are trade-offs, right? Is, you know, if, if I'm gonna expend the energy, the effort, um, you know, if, uh, you know, what am I getting in return for this? And do I feel, 
that there's a value here. And I think one of the things that's that's tricky is everyone has um, a different set of values. Um, you know, it's there's not any one person to, to target. Um, you know, to to uh, to really impress. I think if you get sign off from the leadership, then it's easier. I think from from people to say, okay, maybe we should you know take a second look at this kind of thing. But um, I think what's interesting is um, I think from there there's been multiple different public kind of studies published from some of the larger um, tech companies where it, it's like it, it's too weird to be like a coincidence where like almost all of them have said like you know seven around 70 percent of our bugs are related to memory safety um, and it, you know I've seen posts from Microsoft that say that say this I've seen posts from Google that say this I've seen posts from Mozilla and you know plus or minus a few percentage points but it's always you know greater than 50 percent kind of thing and um, I think really you know I, I used to work on the Rust compiler and you know a lot of the people who who first worked on it a bunch of programming language nerds but also a lot of salty c++ programmers that that really wondered you know why can't we have nice things and um you know i think even even on the android side um we're, we're starting to see a lot more of exploits against android um kind of targeting the linux kernel not so much the user space and so you know, the, the kernel itself is an attack surface. And, you know, I, I mentioned configurability earlier. Um, you know, it's very common for for some of the larger name Linux distributions to, to support all these drivers and, and, and be much larger kernel images versus something like a uh, like a, an individual Android phone will typically turn off a vast majority of the kernel. Um, you know, uh, all of the architecture specific code you know, this only contains code for ARC64. There is no x86 architecture specific code in, in this kernel image or any kernel image, but also, you know, there's there's no support for all the different exotic file systems and all these other things because they're all attack surface really. So really the hope with Rust is can we can we find a like where does it make sense? Um, and I think kind of limiting it to drivers as like an initial test and drivers of something where you know we don't see the kernel driver being too large or large enough where we can't rewrite it in C if we decide this was a terrible idea and it's too much to support. But um, I think realistically, um, kind of targeting the C ABI is is not too difficult from C plus plus and and is pretty straightforward from Rust as well. Um, but from there, you know, building up smarter, safer abstractions for different kernel interfaces and then maintaining them over time. You know, these are all open questions. And, you know, if, if you have interest in that, that there's yet another open source community, you know, I'd, I'd, rec I'd point you to. Um, let me pull it open real quick. And, you know, maybe in the, the show notes or something, we can link to that. But if you're interested in, at all in learning more about that effort, um, I would highly recommend, um, getting involved with that community as well. Um, so, you know, we had a, a presentation this year at Linux Plumbers. I recommend if you go on YouTube, uh, there's a, um, unfortunately it's one big video. I don't, I don't think they sliced and diced them up yet into individual, um, the individual talks, but there's a talk in there about LLVM in the kernel kind of thing and, and getting it started. So, you know, I had prototyped build system support for integrating you know, writing a driver in Rust, and, and it was actually very straightforward. Um, you know, I think there's there's long-term questions around ABIs and stabilities, uh, stabi uh, a ABI stability. Um, you know, if you're using two different versions of LLVM to produce the same executable image, you know, are there any spooky ABI intricacies there? Um, you know, very, very tricky kind of thing. Um, but uh, I, I think, you know, early prototypes show it's possible. My personal laptop has like a hello world driver loaded into it that's built with Rust, which, you know, isn't a great, doesn't exercise most of kind of the kernel, but it is a proof that, you know, you can call back and forth from C into Rust and, and things generally work kind of thing. So um, I think it's still too early to be able to say one way or another that this is a surefire thing, that this is definite, that this will happen. Um, but speaking with Linus, he's kind of said like, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly rooting for Rust. I just hate C++ so much 
that, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm happy to see something else that people are looking into it kind of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, still, still early to tell, but maybe one day we can have nice things. Yeah, I think uh, Adrian did some work on uh, also getting Rust on the M68K uh, architecture. So uh, maybe we see that happening and then uh, it's not a problem at all. Um, let's see. Um... So that reminds me, uh, actually there is a, there's a big part in the current um, LVM backend for M68K support is that I don't think um, currently we support supervised instructions which is you know crucial for kernel stuff um yeah we we um or we only support part part of the supervised instructions uh yeah so that that will be uh, a huge growth blo uh, blockers for the linux kernel so so it, it it might be lower like it may not be a something that you have to pay for initial support um in that yeah you know for, for sure there's definitely instructions where um, they literally only make sense to be executed in a higher like privilege level such that an operating system might be running in. Um, you know, literally yesterday we were discussing with folks at IBM some instructions related to clearing the translation look aside buffer, right? Which again, you know, you only really care about if you're writing an operating system kernel. Um, but uh, I think from the get go by not using Clang's integrated assembler, um, you know, you're not, there's not going to be C code that gets translated somehow to use these instructions. Um, what you'll yeah, end up seeing true. typically is either out of line assembler file where the kernel, they'll use this kind of dot capital S file extension, which is, you know, they run their assembler through the C preprocessor and then assemble it. And, you I know, that, that's a common trick actually for sharing, like kind of pound defining, you know, what's your page size. Right, and then sharing that between C and assembler code, right, is you know kind of nice for that. Um, but uh, or it may exist in like a C um, file, but within inline assembler. And uh, Clang has this option dash no integrated AS. And so for most architectures, kind of by default, really with this effort when we started years ago, like we turn that on right away. Um, and so we've been kind of tightly coupled to the GNU assembler for a while. And only recently did Chrome OS literally like two weeks ago move over to using Clang's integrated assembler for you know the targets for the kernel versions that they support. And you know, Android is trying to move over to it, may get that done next year. But um, I, I think really, you know, avoiding Clang's integrated assembler um, and just focusing on the code gen bugs and, and vanilla C code. Um, is is probably the 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 best way to start. But no matter what, you know, having a bug on file saying like, hey, this instruction, you know, we're gonna have to climb that, like, fix this at some point in time. You know, having it written down somewhere, no matter what, is invaluable kind of thing. Even if it's not, you know, the highest priority thing to fix right away kind of thing. But you know, certainly don't be discouraged that every instruction under the sun isn't supported. Particularly, um, you know, one of the things most recently was uh, that we had a big issue with is. Uh, there's an instruction set extension called IWMM, IWMMXT, which has a very unfortunate history, which is uh, back in the day, Intel actually had an ARM license and um, added s extensions that looked like MMX into the ARM ISA. And um, these were meant uh, to, to help accelerate actually something related to, I think, Wi-Fi. And uh, so the, the kernel actually makes use of this. And another unfortunate side effect is they ended up using this in encoding space for these extensions that ended up getting used for other extensions. And so now, now you have like instructions that are mutually exclusive in terms of the encoding. Like you can either support one or, or the other, but not both, right? Otherwise you have like a conflict there. And uh, eventually I think Intel sold off their ARM license and, and everything. I think Xscale was the, the product name, if I remember correctly. Um, I forgot who they sold it to. I think it, Marvell was involved at some point. I don't know if it went from Intel to Marvell or, you know, it's traded hands multiple, multiple times. And I th think Marvell is the latest holder of that. But um, I think unfortunately, you know, it's something we have to support with Clang or, or LLVM or the kernel um, because 
if you're familiar with the, if you heard of the one laptop per child project, you know, apparently that used a ARM chipset that had these extensions. Um, and so when we looked at supporting this, you know, this is something where we talked, we actually talked with LLVM engineers at ARM and said like, hey, can you support this? Or like add support for these instructions to LLVM so that we could assemble these assembler files in the Linux kernel with this. And they said like, no, no, we don't want anything to do with this, right? And, you know, when we took a look at it, it's a pretty large extension set. There, there were numerous instructions added, but the kernel only leverages six instructions from the, from the extension. Um, and so when we took a look at it, you know, we really said like, you know, no one really wants to support this anymore, but we would like to be able to build this file. Um, and so um, kind of two workarounds there, and we'll call them, um, one is that, you know, we decided, you know, we're not, it's going to be too much effort to provide a full blown implementation for every instruction set under the sun. You know, if we look at, you know, we only really care about these six, you know, you know, does it make sense to only implement those six or not? And we kind of said, it doesn't really make sense for us to support these six um, instructions in LLVM because, you know, if, if we support this additional extension, you're only going to get six instructions instead of, you know, the whole suite. And so whatever you're trying to build probably won't work unless it's specifically the Linux kernel. You know, maybe that's a good starting point or not. But um, what's actually interesting about assembler, that's kind of an interesting trick is, um, and it's used throughout the Linux kernel extensively due to various issues in different tool chains is, let's say your assembler, um, such as Clang's integrated assembler in this case, uh, doesn't support a given instruction. Uh, that is typically not an issue unless there's like some kind of parsing related bug. Um, instead, it's very common for people to insert data as code. Um, and so um, I see Craig Topper is on the call. So fun story with Craig. Um, so there was a, a, you know, a bug most recently where, you know, I think as soon as we reported it, I think Craig had a fix in hand within 24 hours, which is always incredible. <laughs> Um, but it was uh, instruction for x86 is LSL, which, you know, I, I would have guessed maybe logical shift left, even though I think it's only the right shifts that have the logical versus arithmetic. I don't know, but it's it's actually load segment limit. Um, so kudos, you know, if you guessed that, but, you know, small bug where LLVM was rejecting 64-bit operands, and yet the Linux kernel was using that, right? So, you know, quick workaround is to use a, uh, you know, dot long assembler directive, and then literally put the encoding there. And you can use the C preprocessor with some macros to, you know, handle the operands and, and how you encode them kind of thing. But, you know, luckily there are some pressure relief valves there. And so, you know, it, it's not an emergency to get, you know, every instruction under the sun supported. Instead, my recommendation is, you know, pick a dev board, pick a project, and, and really kind of sort or prioritize things based on, you know, what's actually in use, what do you see in the wild, um, you know, don't, uh, my recommendation is don't like Yagni is you ain't going to need it. Right. Is, you know, don't chase things that you don't know or have proof are in use yet kind of thing. Right. You might say, oh, you know, GCC has all these Motorola 68K flags. You know, how do you prioritize going through and implementing and supporting all those? And, and really my recommendation is, you know, find out what software you care about and trying to build it with LLVM and, you know, what really are they using? And, and that kind of helps give you, give you a short list, you know, right off the bat probably gives you a long list. And then from there, you know, try to see what's common between projects and, and try to use that to help prioritize or drive feature development in the, in the tool chain. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thanks for our advice. Uh, oh, hi, Craig. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Craig helped help, uh, help me a lot on uh, reviewing the patch, the M68 patch. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, I, I realize I've been talking a lot the whole time and not following up on the chat. Do folks in the chat have uh, questions in general about the, the project or, or want to know more? Um, yeah, I was, I was monitoring the chat. Um, um, all the links, um, that were posted either by you, Nick, or other people, I will compile them into uh, notes and they will appear uh, besides the video recording. Uh, someone mentioned that uh, IBM gives uh, free um, uh, S390 machines uh, for people who want them. 
or possibly uh, uh, online access, not the machines. Um, yeah, so I think were, what, yeah. what might be interesting from that perspective, because um, I, I think I've seen that as well, where they have like a, a developer, um, a d like a developer, uh, like, I don't know if you call it license or pr like program for access to not just uh, System Z, but also I think some of their like quantum computing stuff, which is interesting, right? Mm. Um, and I think from that perspective, there's a there's an interesting project called Lava. And um, I know a lot of my friends at Lenaro are contributing to it. You know, I don't know if it, in, if it originated from Lenaro, but I know like Lenaro contributes to it actively. Um, but the idea is, you know, particularly in the, like the single board computing world is you have all these different machines. And so, you know, it, it would be nice to kind of abstract, you know, what you're targeting for the purposes of CI. And my understanding is that Lava is really the project where um, they kind of abstract, like they just have a bunch of machines attached um, where some are like QEMU virtualized or emulated instances. Um, some are like, again, virtualized, but they're actually like guests utilizing, you know, virtualization, para-virtualization, KVM kind of stuff, um, or, you know, all these different boards kind of thing. And I think, you know, I, that that's something that we've been working with engineers at, at IBM to say like, hey, QEMU is super important to these communities getting support for that. Lava, super important getting support for that kind of thing. Um, but uh, it's a good reminder that, that, uh, that IBM does offer the developer machines. Um, it, it's probably something I should uh, play around with a little bit. Um, I would say the the first thing that I'm a little he hesitant about with targeting bare metal is generally like the emulated or virtualized targets um, are really good smoke tests. Like it, you know, even for us, you know, if it doesn't boot in an emulator, it's 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 probably not going to boot on bare metal kind of thing. And for the purposes of CI and testing and ensuring we don't regress stuff, I think really getting emulator support first is 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 really important kind of thing before then trying to target a machine. And you know, in particular, I think um, even with a, a guest account, you, you can only really play around in virtualization. They probably don't let you you know install a Clang built kernel on the host machine, which um, it, it at least for virtualization in um, particularly like nested virtualization where guests themselves can have guests, um, you know, you, you need to test both the host and the guest side kind of thing. Um, for the um, um, LLVM M68K and the Linux, uh, is there something that people from the community can already do to help the project? Yeah, I think if, if you have the, if you have um, all the LLVM patches uh, downloaded and, and built and ready to go, I think really the first thing is really, you know, from our, our site, we link directly to the kernel documentation. So, um, you know, I think the first thing that, that's immediately helpful for us is, is really figuring out, getting that short list of like, what, what, what are people trying to target? Um, and uh, what are the issues that they run into when they try this out of the box? Because because mm -hmm. we you know we want to get to the point where this works out of the box for people and they're kind of none the wiser of you know all of the work that went into all the moving pieces for all these different things. Um, and so really, I think um, you know if there's a def config for Motorola 68K in the Linux kernel, you would say uh, you know figure out what the target triple is to cross compile for it, um, and you know. Try to try to build a Linux kernel with LLVM and start sending us bugs. And I think really, you know, the first thing I'd like to do is you know create the label and start tagging bugs and figuring out, you know, getting getting that work list or short log. Um, what's nice about the labels is you can click on a label and then that gives you like a filtered list. And so I can I can then point to someone and say like, here are all our Risk Five bugs, Craig, or <laughs> our X eighty six bugs, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Craig's a good friend of mine. Um, so, uh, but I think that that that, that um, so, for instance, a lot of the Open Mandriva developers, um, you know, they uh, they it was super helpful. They came to us and said, you know, here's a long list of bugs that that we're hitting for our configs, right? Because you know they go out of their way to custom tailor their kernel configurations, and so you know, with 10 to the 6,000 combinations, it's something we don't have CI coverage of 
but now that we know it's important to a given Linux distro, it's very easy for us to say, yeah, we'll ensure this doesn't regress on you. Um, but, you know, we find out they're like, oh yeah, we're, you know, we're enabling 03 by default in Clang and we're enabling, um, uh, what's the linker flag for, look, we're, we're enabling GC sections by default in the linker and like some of these things I'm going like, I don't know, like the kernel doesn't support these out of the box. So like, of course you're hitting issues with it, but you know, at, at the end of the day, having it on file, you know, even if we don't hit it today, we might hit it in the future. We might hit it with a different di Linux distribution, you know, knowing when the patch landed and, and where, when we need to backport things is always super helpful just to have all this documented and written down kind of thing. Yeah, so build root, yeah, so Char Charlie's yeah. mentioning in the chat build root. So that, that's another thing, at least for our CI systems that, that we use heavily um, is, uh, you know, when we are, are kind of basic CI tests are, you know, they would fetch whatever tree and branch of the kernel, um, take a nightly build of LLVM and the latest release build of LLVM, you know, build kernel images, boot them in QM, QMU, um, but the kernel will panic if it's not provided a user space image. Um, you know, it, it looks for an, an init binary, and if it doesn't find one, it'll panic. Or, um, and so we actually <laughs> rely on the, the build root um, open source project to build user space images. So, you know, QEMU, awesome project, little bit user hostile in terms of which command line flags you use. So within our GitHub org, you'll find a project that's, you know, a simple shell, shell script that you just give it, um, you know, what architecture are, like, are you trying to boot in the path to your kernel image? Um, actually, we could make it nicer even and probably run file on the, the kernel image and try to deduce, you know, what architecture is it, right? One less thing to specify and it has compressed user space images um, build with, built with build root. And so, you know, with one, we try to make it as tr trivial as possible. And then like, like to simplify our CI setup. And then like from my day job, I'm like, this is really nice for just boot testing things quickly in a virtualized or an emulated environment. Um, so we kind of forked it out of the, the CI project. So, you know, build root is another thing that I think, um, you know, we just build our user space images for our CI testing with GCC kind of thing. So um, I think like that, that I, my work solely is, is really trying to stay focused on, on the kernel side of things, but you know, there, there are diff, there are multiple different Linux distributions at this point that are, um, you know, either built significantly with Clang and LLVM or entirely with Clang and LLVM. So, uh, sorry, Min, what were you, you saying? Oh, uh, no, so uh, I was just saying, uh, yeah, maybe, we, uh, at least on the backend side, uh, I, I definitely should add more documents. Um, I just thinking about like, what is the best places? Um, so to, to build it, to, to build a backend is nothing special. You just need to use you know experimental uh, backend um, that uh, CMake flex. I think the uh, best, yeah, if, you, if you've updated the, C, the, the, there's a page in LLVM docs for, um, mm -hmm. it's like the most common CMake variables, um, like make, making yeah. sure it's listed there. In fact, I don't even know oh, if we, yeah. we list all the architectures do, there. And, do, and that's a pretty big paper cut. Do, do we auto-generate that one <laughs> from the CMA comment or we need to um, add it by ourselves? But yeah, anyway, um, I can update that places. And also maybe I, I'm thinking about like, um, you know, some really simple toy example for, for user to uh, build a simple Hello World user space program. Uh, using the the, the M sixty eight backend, um, or uh, maybe I can edit the the you know clan build Linux wiki pages to include some instructions. That that will that sounds pretty good. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a yeah, great yeah. start kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think the user that like the top number one could you, um, question user will ask is that what is a target triples, right? <laughs> um, although like currently you, um, the most stable one is still M68 unknown Linux and maybe GNU at the end. Yeah, but yeah, user will ask him what triple should I give? And um, we, we do have some um, M68 specific flags, but that is just, you know, still from the GCC. So if you see any or any common GCC M68 flag, you can use that as well in our client. No. Yeah, generally the Linux kernel will use the the um, the GNU target triple um, and uh, yeah. versus like an embedded 
or freestanding environment. So the, the kernel is mm -hmm. an interesting environment because um, there is no libc, there are no shared objects, yeah. and yet somehow printf is defined. And you know many, many functions are defined in the kernel that you would find um, either you know specified by one of the, the, the C standards or one of the POSIX standards. And um, in general, like the, the kernel is somewhere between an embedded environment, but also a hosted environment. Like, you know, we've had many discussions on the list where, you know, we don't want to be building with dash F freestanding um, because that typically inhibits a lot of lib call optimizations in LLVM and GCC. Um, but on the flip side, then we, the kernel needs to provide um, definitions of various functions that you would find in a hosted environment that would have a libc or POSIX or, you know, compliant libc kind of thing. So, um, so that, that's been a little tricky in, in the, uh, in the past, but, um, in, in general, what ends up happening is like, even, you know, how, how are the sanitizers implemented? How is code coverage implemented? Well, it's very common where either in compiler RT or, um, libgcc s, uh, you would have not not just the sanitizers, but also there's a lot of um, there's a lot of routines where like let's say you're trying to do 64-bit division, but yeah, like the fallback one, like the yep. fallback. Yeah. Yep. So in, instead of like emitting a stream of instructions, instead compiler RT, for instance, will have a library routine, and then uh, Clang itself will emit, uh, or sorry, LLVM will emit lib calls into this, and so basically the environment that this runs in it needs to you know, be able to resolve or relocate references. Um, and so that, you know, the kernel has, is an elf executable. Um, you know, if you build it with EFI, I guess it gets a cough header, unfortunately, but, um, but uh, you know, it has the machinery for finding all the different sections and, you know, relocating itself. That's kind of how the, the dynamically loaded kernel modules for a lot of drivers are implemented kind of thing. And so um, it, it's something where, Particularly, uh, Hexagon has been tricky in this regard because, uh, you know, their initial Linux kernel support was they were like kind of manually saying like, we'll link compiler RT into the kernel. And, you know, I think, you know, I don't know if there's questions there around licensing and, you know, how do the licenses mix for software when it's combined into one image. But, you know, our feedback to them was like, um, instead what you should be doing is providing uh, implementations of these libraries in the kernel sources itself under a GPL license, GPL2 license for the kernel kind of thing. Um, and generally the kernel, like the kernel, you'll, you'll never see, well, you should not see division on 64 bit types in the Linux kernel. Instead you'll see like a macro, which either on a 64 bit um, capable machine will, you know, expand just to the division operator in C, or it may extend expand into some lib call um, or, you know, something. Um, it depends really on the, you know, the, the target kind of thing. But I think that that's another thing, especially for like, you know, early days and getting stuff brought up is, you know, we, we may end up hitting kind of linkage failures where, oh, this, this one routine that happens to also be defined in compiler RT, um, like we're not going to link compiler RT into the kernel. So like we need to look into providing an, an additional implementation of such routine in the kernel sources itself. So Charlie was uh, asking on the chat, um, and I think Nick, you mentioned that in the in the very beginning. Um, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit more about um, what their interesting bugs or issues found in the Linux kernel um, due to the use of CLang LLVM because of the better error messages and code analysis i mean i think i think there's so many that um like when i showed our issue tracker before i just feel like i always had deja vu of like you know i have my finger on every one of those bugs so i feel like um so the the two that come to mind um so the the first one was just like um i like i feel like you know as a personal preference i'm interested in you know, what could you eliminate from a programming language and, and still have it be useful and um, be high level, you know, without getting rid of too much. And I posit that you could eliminate the comma operator from C and still 
like not had a significant loss in expressivity in the language. And in particular, um, there was a really evil bug um, where, well, what's interesting is GCC first implemented dash W misleading indentation and then Klein did. Um, if I remember correctly, I, I may be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure GCC had that first. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, both compilers support this warning, but what we end up finding in practice is there are subtle differences in edge cases for a lot of these. Like, you know, I'm, I'm brutally aware of subtle edge cases where dash W implicit fall through will warn in Clang, but not GCC. I'm painfully aware of cases where dash W format will warn with Clang, but not with GCC. I'm painfully aware of cases where dash W misleading indentation will warn with Clang, but not GCC. And one of these for PowerPC was um, the case of someone had a if statement uh, that can like contained a like a single statement, um, and so there were they omitted curly braces, um, and uh, the single statement was indented properly, but it was not the statement was not properly terminated with a semicolon. Um, it was accidentally terminated with a comma. Um, and so what that means is if you have a single if statement with no curly braces and then you have like one statement on one line, but it happens to be terminated with a comma, you know, whatever the subsequent statement is still going to get executed no matter what. And, um, you know, when we found this, we're like, how, how did GCC not spot this? Like this should be covered already. And, you know, I think it just came down to, you know, uh, just very intricate parsing like complexities related to parsing kind of thing, but it was something where, um, you know, the, the kernel was, I forget what the statement was it was trying to do, but um, it, it wasn't pretty. It was definitely something of like, oh God, this looks terrifying, like of, of you know, what, what's going on here. Um, so personally, that, that one was my favorite really, but um, one of the other ones where when we found this, we're like, my God, this is terrifying. Um, so um, the, the kernel's obsessed with keeping track of time, right? It's, it's critical for a cooperative multitasking operating system to have some notion of time. And, you know, time is a funny thing to a computer because, you know, to, you know, pretty much everyone on earth, time is measured in like, you know, seconds, minutes, you know, some like wall clock time is, is really what we think of it. But um, to a computer, it's a little different. Um, Particularly, you know, it was quite some time until computers actually had, um, you know, reliable or even high precision clocks. Um, and so, you know, cycles is yet another measure of the passage of some work being done. And so the kernel actually has very interesting functionality around, you know, is there a real time clock on this hardware or a high precision timer that we can rely on? Um, you know, clocks burn a lot of power. And so the, the kernel actually, there's a lot of machinery around, you know, can I power off a clock or not, right? There's different clocks for different buses, for different devices. Um, yeah, clocks going backwards mentioned in different cases, like are they monotonically increasing or not? Um, and so like literally when the kernel goes to sleep, which is, you know, when I, when I lock the screen of my Android phone, the kernel is actually, it's doing a, a, a depth first traversal of it's powering off every device attached to every bus. Once, once each device attached to each bus is powered off, the bus will power down and then um, each CPU will power down itself. And then like literally this phone is off except for the various microcontrollers that happen to be on the motherboard, right? And those are significantly lower power than the, the application processor. But, um, but uh, so, you know, clocks in embedded systems are super, super important, big topic. Um, and so, you know, the kernel, there's no guarantee that it has a clock that gives you a measurement in seconds or nanoseconds or whatever. Um, you know, delays are super important. You know, they're, they're pretty brittle for your, uh, your um, uh, kind of multi-threaded or multi-core execution. You don't want to use them for that, but it, it's actually pretty common as well in drivers to have explicit um, either millisecond or microsecond delays. Um, for instance, you know, a data sheet may say, you know, you need to send this bit pattern as a command, and then there's some setup and hold time of 
you know, 10 millisecond, uh, 10 microseconds or something. And then you, then you should try to read a bus kind of thing or something like that. So, you know, and then in the, really the most important use case is, is time slicing, right? Is, you know, for cooperative multitasking is, you know, I have more tasks than I do physical CPU cores. So, you know, how do I get, how do I run multiple things at once and, and not have a system that's like locked up doing any one thing, right? And the kernel kind of hides this by time slicing, which is really, you know, running different processes, you know, with different priorities and, you know, scheduling is just a huge, huge topic. And there's multiple different schedulers in the kernel. This is like, you know, uh, there's all kinds of out of tree patches and hacks and custom schedulers. And, you know, how do you take into account energy models and, and you know, work to be done. And now ARM is doing like little in order cores and big out of order execution cores and like, you know, has implications for scheduling and stuff. But, but, you know, no matter what time is critical, you know, really important concept in the kernel, but um, we don't want to use seconds as the units for that. So instead the kernel has a unitless concept called jiffies, right? And so one of the things we said is, um, you know, we, we build a lot of software these days with LLVM um, taking advantage of LTO and, you know, either PGO or auto FTO and the Linux kernel didn't support either. And, um, you know, LLVM was really designed from day one with LTO in mind, kind of the module system. And, you know, there's plenty of fun bugs you'll, you'll run into with, you know, trying to get a code base to build with LTO, both in your code base and in LLVM. So, you know, long bloody road there. But um, one of the things we found was, um, so Chrome OS was upgrading in 4.4 x86-64 kernel. So Chrome OS, Google distributes this kernel image for multiple, multiple Chromebooks in the kind of the, the, the OEM or manufacturer is kind of none the wiser really. Um, and uh, I mean, maybe they do some qualification. I don't know. I don't know the story is there, but um, you know, they, they did a compiler upgrade and suddenly like, you know, one ISA, one kernel version, it just stopped booting. Right. And so, so I kind of dug into, you know, really what, what's the bug here. Um, and it was a very spooky bug because when the kernel's booting, you know, typically, you know, no matter what it'll typically a machine will start up with some kind of bootloader. Um, you know, it's very common to have, like DRAM training, unfortunately, and, you know, some very low level hardware initialization, but then typically bootloaders will kind of no return or tail call, like jump um, into, into the kernel image. And, you know, the Linux kernel image is typically a um, self decompressing ELF executable. It has support for command line flags. If you've ever played around in Grub, you know, I've even, you know, personally on my laptop, I have to say like, no, no, the whole sensor is like inverted kind of thing. And like, you know, tell the kernel, but you can like carve out memory and say like, you know, I have physical RAM that's damaged. Like don't back physically, like don't back, like don't store pages in this, this region and stuff, right? So command line flags, um, you know, typically it'll start in a very machine specific way. There's linker, custom linker scripts that'll define the entry point for the kernel image. And typically, you know, it will typically be handwritten assembler um, kind of thing, but, you know, can, can be a mix, you know, it's more so, you know, what's easier and what's the fastest really, um, you know, all these architectures have really horrible things that you need to do to really initialize things, but then, you know, that code typically will then itself, you know, no return tail call into uh, generic C code in the kernel. So start kernel is, you know, if you're ever looking to learn more about the Linux kernel, grep for start underscore, underscore kernel is really the entry point of um, kind of the, the architecture agnostic C code for the kernel. And, um, you know, that that's where in the high level C code, you'll see calls to like arch underscore initialize underscore clocks. And then that might be architecture specific or it may be a generic implementation and stuff like that. So, um, you know, really good series on LWN recently about, um, yeah, exactly. The the 32 bit ARM kernel from Linus Wallage is uh, works at ARM and is the GPIO maintainer and probably maintains a ton of other stuff too, but you know, really great sequence of like, what are some of the nasty things you need to, to, to do really to initialize, you know, very architecture specific stuff. And, you know, x86 also needs to trampoline between like real mode to protected mode and, you know, 16 bit code in there, 32 bit code in there, 
64 bit code in there kind of thing. So, you know, all these, all these messy things, but, but going back to, you know, what was this awful bug, right? So, you know, kernels running through its initialization and then, you know, what it does is it tries to find this init binary, which is going to be PID zero, PID one, I forget. I think it's PID zero. Um, but basically it's kind of the initial process and, and really, you know, what, in what, um, like all processes in, in like Unix environments have parents, uh, parent process IDs, right? Um, PPIDs. And it, they form a tree all the way back to init. And, you know, init, you know, you could have a sys5 init, you could have systemd, but realistically there's some form of how, how does a system administrator describe to their um, operating system uh, how should processes get launched in user space when a system is starting? but also how should they be relaunched if they exit prematurely or unexpectedly. Um, and so basically the kernel will try to find a NIT um, and load it into memory. Um, you know, the, the kernel has some loading it does with, um, you know, uh, loading things like the virtual dynamic shared um, objects that help you, you know, get, get what, how much time has passed without context switching into the kernel and not. Um, but what it does is it, it adds the init binary to a work queue, and then it finally um, no calls, uh, no return calls into the scheduler and says, okay, now that we have, you know, work to schedule in a queue, go ahead and start scheduling it. And it will run it for, you know, pick whatever's in the front of the queue, you know, run it for a certain amount of time, uh, set a timer that will go off, um, you know, so this will run for a certain amount of time, then a timer will trigger, in interrupt, which will kind of restore control flow to the kernel, and the kernel sits in a loop that's the scheduling loop. So it, it it's you know it does some initialization, and then um, you know there there's some kernel. Uh, I mean things are trickier with Specker and Meltdown, but you know there's some 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 data and and code from the kernel is actually in the address space of the user space process, and there's things the kernel has to do to like validate pointers from user space. Um, belong to user space and not the kernel kind of thing, but um, they like uh, the the kernel once it's done all this initialization really is just sitting in a while true loop. You can think of it essentially as like a timer based system for um, for scheduling things. And um, so basically, this concept of jiffies is is really I can't stress how critical jiffies are in the kernel. And for the x eighty six um, sixty four target they had an ODR violation for this global variable. Um, and the only way that we spotted this um, was that uh, when we were, we started building kernels with LTO, uh, you know, LTO tends to trip up ODR bugs more frequently, I guess. Um, but this was something where, you know, we ended up finding like, oh boy, this is tricky because, um, in order to maintain compatibility with 32-bit binaries on a 64-bit x86 system, they're actually using linker scripts to define symbols, um, to define actually aliases between symbols. So, you know, fun fact, um, you can forward declare variables in C and then actually define them in a linker script. So like the kernel will do this to denote ranges of uh, global variables so that it can like, iterate lists of like global variables of data that's been squirreled away in custom elf sections and stuff. Um, but essentially what was happening, you know, observably is, you know, the kernel would start, it would run through all its initialization. It would, you know, put init in the, the initial work queue. It would call schedule. And then like it, the schedule, like, and it would never end up actually getting scheduled or run. And we were kind of at the, this point where like, what, like this thing is haunted. What the hell is going on here? And uh, and so the trick, what we did there is we started bisecting the object files itself. Um, you know, a trick you can do for isolating compiler issues is, you know, if you have a known good ver known good version and known bad version, you know, maybe there's a regression in there kind of thing. You can kind of isolate and see, you know, what changed on the compiler side. But actually the bisection we did here was, you know, we had object files from a good build and a bad build and we simply linked them together in, in isolated, you know, which translation unit was the bug in. And then from there, we took a look at the disassembly of the object file between the two and found that, 
um, you know, only one function differed and only in a place where it referred to a global variable. And, you know, if you, if you disassemble with relocations printed, you know, it prints the name of the variable you expect. And if that address doesn't match up between two translation units, you know, you, you have a problem kind of thing. And when we took a look at it, we found out like, oh, someone made a mistake here when they like 10, 20 years ago, I don't know, whenever they first started supporting 64-bit x86, um, when they did this was they actually introduced an ODR violation. And, you know, for, for whatever reason, people happen to be getting lucky by this, but, you know, because we've been aggressively pursuing LTO, building kernels with LTO, um, because this works relatively well with LOVM, you know, module lots of bugs we fixed in LLVM. Um, I, I think that was something to me where I'm like, I, I'm really glad we found this because this this was a time bomb, you know, waiting to happen. And and you know, just act of God that that no one that this didn't cause a catastrophic issue for anyone else, kind of thing. Um, but you know, I, I feel like I have so many stories of like, um, I don't know, AMD GPU driver had a stack misalignment bugs. Right, so um, x86-64 typically uses a 16-byte stack alignment, which was like great when unwinding via frame pointers was the cool thing to do instead of out of line via dwarf. And you know, there's it, there's actually a trade-off there because you know, zero cost exception handling doesn't mean zero cost in all cases. It it means zero cost in the happy path and like 10 10 or a hundred times the cost in the exceptional case. Um, and uh, so it, you know, even the kernel itself, many architectures have multiple unwinders and you can pick which one you're using. And, you know, hopefully you don't intend to panic, but maybe tracing is important to you and having very low overhead traces is important to you. And, you know, chasing frame pointers is much cheaper on many architectures, but, you know, x86 typically would push a frame pointer, which, um, and then a call would push the return address on a stack. So, you know, it, it was just very common, you know, you'd call a child function. So your stack would be misaligned by eight bytes. Then the prologue of the, of the call E would push the frame pointer. So you're realigned by six to 16 bytes. And then from there you can make subsequent calls. Um, and if your stack was ever misaligned, you know, you'd get like a, a SIG bus or something like an alignment related issue. Um, and you see these a lot still in x86 with some of the, the extensions that require um, operands to be aligned and stuff, right? And so AMD GPU driver is like one of the few drivers in the kernel that's actually using, um, that's actually using some of these instructions that require these operands. You know, floating point is frowned upon in the kernel, but supported basically adds overhead to context switches. Um, and, uh, but there's a lot of SSC2 instructions that the AMD GPU compilers was relying on. And uh, so the kernel itself is actually built with eight byte stack alignment. So, you know, they kind of threw out frame pointer based on winding in the x86 Linux kernel a long time ago. You know, they have their own custom thing for unwinding that itself is a, is a huge topic. But um, basically the AMD GPU driver was being built um, using SSC2, but relying on an eight byte stack aligned kernel. And so you kind of have two interfaces into the kernel where you can think of user space makes calls down into the kernel via system calls. There's a syscall interface, um, but then there's also this kind of interrupt interface where, you know, the hardware does something wacky and the kernel, a lot of the drivers set up kind of callbacks um, into this, like you have uh, typically the hardware will trigger some kind of interrupt and then the kernel has some way of decoding, you know, what kind of interrupt was this and what callback should I invoke? Right. And, you know, this was something where, you know, the kernel driver would build and the syscall interface was good, but the interrupt interface would cause a panic um, kind of thing due to, you know, as soon as we executed one of these SSC2 instructions, you know, depending on the context, whether it was interrupt or not, and depending on the current stack alignment, you know, sometimes eight is a multiple of 16 and sometimes it's not, right, depending on your current stack depth. Um, so, you know, that, that was another unfortunate kind of ugly bug but um yeah i one of these days I, I feel like i'll put together another lovm keynote someday of you know the war stories of what are all our awful awful bugs because th there's been quite a few so i think you know luckily a lot of my message has been to kernel developers is like you know there, there's a very rich history here between linux and, and gcc you know we don't want to 
get in the way of that. We don't want to come between that. We don't want to try to replace GCC in any form. Instead, you know, there are benefits in software engineering to loosely coupling um, systems or projects. And, you know, we think we can help you find truly nasty stuff. And by having, you know, paying this cost ourselves, um, you know, hopefully that helps you, um, you know, it, it gives you choice um, and uh, kind of freedom of choice and um, helps you, helps eliminate um, some cases where, you know, maybe GCC will be able to take advantage of more aggressive undefined behavior via the as if rule someday kind of thing. But um, Spark, question about Spark. So, you know, turns out there's still a Spark 32 system in support. There's a thread this past week about that. So, you know, LLVM's first backend, I believe, was Spark, uh, ironically. So I think that, that's something where um, we might be able to build it in some configuration, but, you know, is 64-bit the future or is 32-bit? It turns out there is still at least one 32-bit system that's in support for the foreseeable future there. Kind of interesting. But. Yeah, there was also this uh, discussion on, uh, or article on LVM about uh, Linux 32-bit future. Um, and it will, at least for, for um, Intel, it will not go away quickly. I think uh, the, the best reference I have for that is there's an LWN article that was published within the past two weeks by Arne Bergman, um, mm. who works for Lenaro, um, recently implemented all of um, the Linux kernel's 2038 time T, like 64-bit time T support, um, and has interesting studies around 32-bit ARM and, and basically predicts that 32-bit ARM will be around for the, at least the next 10 years. Um, but interesting data he has around um, system configurations and really um, kind of comes down to a system integrator when choosing to produce a product. Um, there's kind of a sweet spot based on the kind of workload you have dictates how much DRAM you would put in the system. And based on the capacity of DRAM, there's really sweet price points for DDR3 versus DDR4 at this moment. Um, and, uh, you know, that that has um, implications on what kind of SOC that you can support. So, you know, when when choosing to build a system, some system integrators don't actually choose the CPU first. They choose, you know, how much RAM will we need, right? Um, and then kind of go from there. So, um, yeah, I think 6502 though doesn't support, um, isn't supported by the Linux kernel. So luckily I don't have to worry too much about 6502. <laughs> um, I think in particular, um, like some of the, the, like you don't really see really great 8-bit support in the kernel. You know, I, I don't know what minimum requirements are for, for different systems and stuff, but uh, I think tool chain support is a, is a big one, right? But um, also having an MMU when writing an operating system is, is a tremendous benefit, and yet not all systems have MMUs, right? And, and that just adds additional and significant complexity <laughs> to uh, maintaining a kernel. So yes, um, let's see if there are more questions. Any more questions from the uh, participants, the chat? So if not, thank you so much for inviting me here today, Karsten. It was it was great to you know get a chance to to meet everyone and and you know kind of plug what we're working on. And and you know I I think you know to me the Linux kernel was is is you know for ten years people understood in the LLVM community that this was a milestone. To be able to support this this body of software, and you know, I I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, so you know, I, I think you know potentially it's an interesting body of software to start supporting, um, kind of thing, or to to look at kind of testing. And you know, for sure, if you're if you're looking for work to do, if you're looking to get started, I think you know that that's a big thing for a lot of people getting started contributing to open source or to any project. You know, even if they're already familiar contributing to open source, you know, how do I get involved with kernel development? Or how do I get involved with LLVM development? And I would say, you know, this the intersection of these two projects is a um, unyielding bounty of work to do. <laughs> so if folks are interested in, in, you know, helping out on either projects, you know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, help folks get up to speed on contributing to either code bases kind of thing. <laughs> 
So again, thank you so much for having me here today. And I, I look forward to, to hearing from you all and, and working with you together more in the future. Yeah, thank you, Nick. This was really, really interesting and uh, nice uh, and interesting stories and background information on how uh, this big project works and how it does come along. Thank you very much.